So we're going um, to be talking about fear tonight, but at the end of this message, we're going um, to provide opportunities for baptism. So we have a friend of ours that's going to get baptized. And um, then any, anybody would like to is here tonight that would like to get baptized, still nice and warm outside. It's a good night. Uh, we got everything we need for you, and just, just be thinking about that. And um, you'd like to turn your life over to Jesus in a way, you know, and that way tonight we'd love to be able to do that. So fear is um, the word that we're talking about tonight. Fear has to do with a lot of stuff. I mean, like, we could go through a uh, whole list of things that individuals are afraid of. We could go through the top 10 of, top 10, 10 things people are afraid of. Number one, by the way, of all, th- it's unbelievable to me thinking of the stuff I'm afraid of, but number one is um, public speaking. Did you know that? <laughs> it's like, really? I mean, I can think of a lot of other stuff, man. Like, I mean, I'm definitely more afraid of doctors than I am of public speaking. I'm definitely more afraid of dentists than I am of public speaking. More afraid of yellow jackets, um, hornets, I could, copperheads. I mean, I could go on down the list, but, but I won't. But I mean, I want to talk about like some of the stuff that really puts fear in our lives. Because many, I think, uh, in recovery, one of the hardest things to grasp is like the belief. Most of us, when we're in the middle of an act of compulsion, all we know is fear, amen? When is the next bad thing gonna happen? When is the next bad thing gonna happen to me? What is the next thing I'm gonna lose control of? What is the next thing I'm gonna be disappointed by? Like all we know is fear. All we really know is how to be afraid. And so what are some of the things that go into the ingredients? What are some of the ingredients of fear? Well, one of them is obviously loss of perceived control. You know, like I put the word perceived in there because when we're honest and if we begin to understand recovery, we're gonna realize, what are we gonna realize? We're really not in control of anything, amen? Most of us don't like that very much. Someone told me today, you know, I really don't think most people, most of us, get past step one for a very, very long time. That's because we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but that's because like that's how, that's really how we're wired now in our, you know, in our broken state. We're like wired to go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be in charge. So Loss of perceived control is one. Um, fear about suffering is another. Someone in our group, when we put these messages together, she said, I'm not really afraid of um, dying, but I'm very afraid of suffering when I, when I die. Does that make sense? You know, and so we had a conversation in, the, in that room Tuesday morning for a little bit. One person in our team said that she thought she would rather die by like guillotine. And I'm like, Guillotine, what happened just, what, that, what happens if it's a, not a sharp deal? What do you, I mean, I don't think that's good, right? I don't know about a guillotine. I would kind of vote, no, I have other ways, you know, but that, that wouldn't be it. But we worry and we are afraid, most of us are afraid of the idea um, of suffering. You know, like a lot of that, that, no doubt about it, like, you know, I, I'm the guy that if I were to go to, into a doctor's office or any kind of dentist, any, any, anything, my, uh, I know that my blood pressure will go up about 30 points. I have that white coat, they call it white coat syndrome. Anybody else got that? My, now, I've, now my youngest daughter has inherited that. You know, and it's like, I, mean, I feel bad kind of because I know, I absolutely know where she got that from. You know, I do. But that fear of, it's that fear of pain, you know, is what that's really all about. A lot of us um, are afraid of the disapproval of others. Others of us are afraid of defectiveness, how we're defective or how we're unworthy. If you go to um, 10 open speaker meetings at AA or NA, eight out of 10, somebody's gonna talk in their, in their talk about feeling like they were the odd person out, right? They were always the person that was in a group that was neglected. They're gonna talk about feeling like um, Nobody wanted them to be around them. They're gonna feel, they're gonna talk about their, their unworthiness. That's what they're gonna talk about. Another piece is for a lot of us, you know, we, most of us are afraid of the unknown, right? We're afraid of the unknown. You can take a, um, you know, the, the, combine the unknown with the suffering thing. So you take somebody into a, um, into a hospital and they need to be in a hospital and so one of the things they're gonna automatically do is they're gonna get very hyped up about not knowing what's gonna happen next. And you know that they're gonna be getting better when they stop complaining about that and they start complaining about the food and the nurses. They wanna get out of there. They're getting better, amen? They're getting better. But the unknown, 
How is this gonna change, you know, when you, there's a stress meter? And so you can, you can say to somebody, tell me the five things that have happened to you lately. And you say to me, well, I just went through a divorce, or you say, this is interesting, but you say, I just got married, same number of points, by the way. You, um, you, it is, I mean, you can say, I just had a baby, that's a lot of points. You can say, I moved, that's about a thousand points. You can say, I moved to another city, which is, you know, like, think that through for a minute. Like most, a lot of people are gonna go, man, I really had this, I really got this going on in my life. You know what I need? I really need, I need to change, I need to change a venue, right? I need to move to uh, Memphis, or I need to move to Atlanta, or I need a change of geographical change. That's a thousand points on the stress meter. You know, if there's a death in your family, it's a thousand points. I could go through that, but you know, the unknown causes us anxiety, right? It really does. If we knew what was gonna happen in our lives, we would, I think, you know, a lot of us would feel like we would do a lot better. The chief activator of our defects has been self-centered, now get this, self-centered fear. Primarily, fear that we would lose something, or our mind was someone, we already possessed, or would fail to get something we demanded. I would lose something that um, I believed I had, or I would not get something that I believe I wanted. Living upon a basis of unsatisfied demands or expectations, we were in a state of continual disturbance. Does this sound like right? Continual disturbance and frustration. Therefore, no peace was to be had unless we could find a means of reducing, of reducing these expectations, these demands, that's out, of the, um, that's out of the 12 and 12. So I wanna talk about, like how did fear show up in the first place? So you have, there are these two people in the Bible, first two people in the Bible, their names were Adam and Eve. And God, they're the first two creations, first two creatures that God made, first two human beings. And, and so God has this talk with them and he explains to them how he's gonna love them and take care of them. And God goes, everything you need in this world is gonna be right here with me. I'm gonna always provide for you. I'm gonna always take care of you. You don't have to be afraid of anything. You know, I'm gonna always be your God. You're always gonna be my children. This is gonna be a great relationship and I'm gonna love you and you're gonna love me. And there is no mention, there is no mention in that story whatsoever. Go back, it's in the very first, um, I don't recommend people read the first part of the Bible first really, but anyway, in this case, go, you can go and read the first three chapters of this book called Genesis, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So in those three chapters, there is no mention, none of A, death, or B, fear. Like Adam and Eve are living in a time with God as human beings, believe it or not, when they do not know Fear. So what changes? Well, God tells them, here's the only thing. There's eight billion fruit-bearing trees in this garden, in this place where we're living together. I need to ask you not to eat fruit from this tree way back in the back. The name of that tree is called, you know, the tree of good and evil. And you, I'm gonna ask you not to eat the fruit from that tree. Why did God ask them? Why did God ask them not to do that? I'm going to get there in a minute. But um, Beth Moore is a woman that uh, teaches, uh, teaches like does Bible studies. And um, one of the people in my group that works on these messages on Tuesday suggested I go look at these questions that Beth Moore asks or believes that God might have asked when he saw Adam and Eve decide that they were gonna do exactly what he told them not to do, right? And that was eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like we're gonna get into what happened to them and we're gonna get into why it happened, but she has these five questions. I think they're really good. Here's the first one. Now remember, God knows the answers to all these questions, right? So he's asking them, he's asking them for Adam's sake and for Eve's sake. Are you following me? He's asking them for Adam and for Eve, not for God. First question, you know, Adam and Eve have this breach with God which really, that breach with God has had this ripple effect in all of us, which is why step one starts with step one, right? Step one is saying, 
am I willing, am I really willing to let God be God in my life? And am I really willing to let God be the only God in my life? And am I aware of the fact that right now there's a bunch of people in the room with the label God on it or a bunch of things? And like my name is on there. My name is on there. My drug of choice is on there. You know, alcohol is on there. Whatever it is, is on there. My compulsion is on there. Sex addiction is on there. It's on the, you know, that's like in a competitive relationship with God. Are you following me? And the fear because of that is intense because now I know, now I know that difference of good and evil. Before what Adam and Eve knew was good. They knew good. They just knew good. And God designed, that to, God designed it that way to allow them to love him in a completely free and open way. And to do that, God had to give them this choice. But I, want, I mean, I'm, I am sure that when God is asking these questions, I mean, you can ask him when we all get there. I am sure that when God is asking these questions, he is grieving. He is grieving and experiencing sadness because of the brokenness that is now between him and Adam and Eve, right? And also because he knows what is gonna happen, not only to Adam and Eve, but he knows what's gonna happen to all of us right then at that moment. And he knew it before, which is why he said, please don't do that. Trust me. And they didn't. Here's the first question. Adam and Eve, what's the first thing they do when they realize they've broken their relationship with God? They run. They hide. God's first question, where are you? Where are you? That's a very loving question. It isn't like God is going to go and look around every rock and seek them out and just hammer on them. It is like God wants them to be able to realize, you know, look, I still love you. I, I, I need you to be trusting enough of me to come to you even now, even now when you're broken. It's like we were talking about, we were talking about the other day. God loves, I, told, I was talking Sunday about the turning point for me in my life of learning to trust God with everything and realizing that God is only on my side. And that is that this one scripture out of Romans, while I was yet while I was yet broken, while I was standing there behind the rock in the Garden of Eden, while I didn't trust God, while I was on the run, while I was at my worst state, Jesus loved me enough to shed his blood for me and die for me. Right then, not when I had my act together, when I didn't have my act together, not when I was standing there in the garden with God and everything was right, when I was behind the rock, amen? That is, you know, that's why this question is, is theirs because God wants to see if he can establish trust with Adam and Eve. He loves them enough to see if he can get some trust built with them even after they're broken because he loves them. Where are you? Second question. This is a big one. Remember I said that Adam and Eve had no fear prior to um, this breach with God, right? They didn't know it. There is an interesting little phrase um, in this story that, it's, that says, Adam and Eve were both at one time, while they were with God and there was no breach, Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. Translation, they were completely vulnerable. They were vulnerable with each other. They were vulnerable with God. They were vulnerable with their relationship with God. They had no fear. It's like, I, want, I, want to, I don't know if you're in a relationship now or not, but if you're in a marriage or you're dating somebody or, or whatever it is, or you have a friend, that ought to cover most all of us. You know, you have a relationship. Let me ask you, what would it be like if every time you were with that person, you never had to ask, I wonder if they told me all, everything about that. I wonder if I could really share this with them, this whole thing freely. It's kind of like, why is it so hard? Why is it so freaking hard to do a fourth step and a fifth step? It's so hard to do a fifth step because you are being asked to talk to another human being who at the base of it, you do not trust about all the stuff in your heart, right? That's why you gotta do it four or five times because you dump 30% a shot maybe and you withhold the rest, why? Because you don't really know if you trust them. If I say that, are they still gonna love me? Am I still gonna be okay? That's why in the fifth step it says also have this conversation with God. You're gonna know how much you trust God based on what you're gonna withhold. Does that make sense? 
And the fear that we have is coming from this experience right here. Who told you that you were naked? They didn't know that before. Now all of a sudden it said they were naked. When they ran from God, it said they looked at each other. They were naked and they were ashamed. They were naked and they were ashamed. Now fear is in full operation. God wants to know who told them that they should be ashamed because what he's saying to them, it wasn't me. It was you. It was the enemy. It was that relationship. It wasn't, your, it wasn't yours and mine. It was the enemy's. We, we are so fascinated. We are so fascinated with the idea that God is a judge that we completely miss the point that the only reason that God ever wanted to exist for you or for me was to love us. That's it. Like we love the idea. Since we would think like that, we love being able to put God in the judge box, even in this original story, because it's more attractive to us that God is a judge than that God is completely in love with us. Here's the next question. What are you seeking? What did you want out of that? When you broke our relationship, what were you looking for? What wasn't enough? Like I ask the question all the time, somebody wrote it over here, that the cross of Jesus, is the cross of Jesus enough or whatever that says over on that wall? Is Jesus enough? Is God enough for you? If the answer to that question right now tonight is no, number one, keep coming back. And two, I will guarantee you, you will not have peace in your life until the answer to that question is yes. And that is what we're here to do on Thursday nights. We are here on Thursday nights to find a way to help you to understand how much God loves you to such a degree that you're finally gonna let him fall fully in love with you and you're finally gonna fall fully in love with him and you're gonna step out from your rock. Amen. You're gonna step out and away from your rock. <laughs> Here's the next question. Here's the next question. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? We're afraid because the enemy tells us to be afraid. We're not afraid because of anything God did right there. Look at the story. We're afraid because the enemy tells us to be afraid. God tells Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will, you will surely die. You're gonna die. What is he talking about? He's not saying you're gonna die right now on the spot. He's saying you're gonna experience mortality, which is how I know that the design plan of God was never that people were gonna die. Why are you afraid? Here's the next question. This is a great one. How much more, how much more personal satisfaction do you need? Not like, not like how much satisfaction, because God, remember, was gonna satisfy every need they had. It's still too true tonight. God is here tonight to satisfy every, not some needs, every need I have. Every need you have, that may sound like unbelievable to you right now, but that's what God is here to do tonight is satisfy every need you have. See, we fight, we all stand around and we fight for knowledge and we fight for power. But the thing we need is love. <laughs> we fight for knowledge and power, but the thing we need is to be loved. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We ask ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Well, self-reliance was good enough as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem. Because see, like the more self-confidence you have, the more vulnerable you are because the more you're believing that you can do everything in life all by yourself, right? That's a vulnerability. That is a vulnerability. I mean, think that through. Like, it's just like going, well, I mean, I'm gonna work on my self-esteem. It's like, how about, how about if you take your hands off of your esteem and you let God put his hands on you? And how about if you let God's holy hands, the ones with the holes in them from going up on a cross, how about if you let those hands come around you and you let God work on your esteem? How about that? Because I can guarantee you one thing, if you let God work on your esteem, the enemy has no play. If you work on your esteem, has a lot of play. God works on your esteem, no play whatsoever. It didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Perhaps there's a better way, we think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying on God 
what that creation story said, right? We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are, on, we are in the world to play the role God assigns us. We're not the author, we're not the playwright, we're just in the play, amen? Big difference, just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity? Now get this, when that happens, we match the calamity in our lives, the chaos with serenity, that's out of the big book. Here's another, when fear persisted, we knew it for what it was and we became able to handle it. We began to see each adversity as a God-given opportunity to develop the kind of courage which is born of humility rather than of bravado. Like there is just a need in us that goes all the way back to the day that God put Adam and Eve on the earth. And the need for us the need for us is that we're, we just got to know Jesus. I mean, like most times in the church, what you're hearing people talk about is, well, here's, here are the reasons you need Jesus. You need Jesus because you're a completely screwed up person. Back in the day, if you had a, if you had a revival, they would go, you're like, you're, I love this phrase, they would go like, you're like, you're like filthy rags. You know, you're like a worthless person, right? And what the objective was in the church then was, let me see if I can get you feeling so down about yourself that I had to pick you up with a pitchfork because you know that was gonna work. If I could intimidate you into feeling like a wretch, that was another favorite word. If I could do that, then I could just, I could basically get you to go, you don't have a choice, sucker, to accept Jesus. Like that is not, that, that right there is not the gospel. The reason is, the deal is we need Jesus because God always designed us to be with Jesus. When God was talking to Adam and Eve in the garden, now listen, that was Jesus there. That was Jesus. When God came looking for Adam and Eve, that was Jesus. God already knew what it was gonna, the suffering it was gonna take. He was already in the game being Jesus for Adam and Eve. They didn't know it. God fully knew it. There's never been another personality of God that isn't Jesus. Like you look, people, I don't know, I don't really feel like I know God. It's like, yeah, you do. You know, I mean, I can tell you all about Jesus. I can tell you what he did, what he taught, where he lived, who his sister was, who his brothers were. I can tell you all about his family, everything you wanna know. I can tell you all about God, so much about God because I know Jesus. When we meet Jesus, something is gonna happen to us. And it's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see at least one person tonight get into that tank. You are going to see him go through a death. The him that was him before he decided he was gonna go all in with Jesus was the guy standing behind the rock afraid of what God was gonna do next. The guy that's gonna get out of that tank tonight is gonna be completely free, completely redeemed, and completely aware of who he belongs to, who he is as a man, and how much God loves him in Jesus. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus in baptism, we joined Jesus in his death? Because we died and were buried with Jesus by baptism. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we too tonight can live new lives. Since we have been united with Jesus in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was, just like him. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Jesus so that the sin might lose its power in our lives. And here's the thing, we tonight are no longer slaves to sin, we're free. Man, in Jesus' sweet name, amen. If you wanna get baptized, get ready, amen.